No, that's because I'm not saying anything. Okay, now I will. When I get... Okay, now that's all happening. Okay, so how many people have we got tonight? Excellent. Okay, so in case there is anybody new, same as previously, oh come on, work. Um, please do take your own notes. We will not be sharing these slides. And please be aware also that the course the MB200 course and the exam do appear to be quite different. So the key to passing this exam is using the skills measured document. Also note that there are some questions on features that have changed. That is what it is. There is nothing we can do about it. The exam as a whole, this is what it looks at and those percentages are roughly the way the marks are divvied out and also therefore how you should split your time both your revision time and the time during the actual exam what we are looking sure are you not seeing the slides Oh, flipping heck, Where, where's Teams got to? Um, so, where are we? Share screen. Which screen shall I share? That one looks reasonable. Yes. Thought Karen was. Okay, I will keep going and let's hope we can get most of it recorded. I can't see anymore who's on. Let's see if I come back. Okay, awesome. So what we're looking at today is a load of questions and a little bit of theory around performing solution deployment and testing, which should be roughly a quarter of both your revision time and the time it takes in the exam. Come on. So what we're looking at here is the apps that you may have in any one instance or environment of Dynamics 365. So what we've got here is a whole load of apps. You can see here that most of them are enabled, but that the LinkedIn lead gen has not yet been configured. Now I have a horrible feeling that that slide is in the wrong place and we'll come back to where it should be later on. Something that you do need to be very aware of because it is one of those things that gives them lots and lots of detail that they can then check in the exam is all of the different admin or administration centers. So there are those five administration centers and I would strongly recommend 
that you all take time to make sure that you know what all of those do and more specifically what you can access from each of them. You see from if my laser pointer will work this is what you will see on the left hand side when you go into all admin. So note that the Power Platform Admin Center is not accessible through the admin centers. I'm now going to run on and give you some screenshots of some of these admin centers. But I would strongly recommend that in your own environment, you go through and look at all of this yourself in a reasonable amount of detail. So this example, this screenshot, is the Dynamics 365 Administration Center, and it's showing the one environment that we've got available. And then if you look in the big box in the middle, you can see that from there we can open that environment or instance. That is the instances tab of the Dynamics 365 Admin Center. Be aware also that the 365 Admin Center is, well, quite often you will get an alert in it pushing you into either Power Platform or Power Apps. So the implication is that this reasonably soon is going to go away, even though it's relatively new. This is the updates, and this is where you would go to see whether there are any updates for your instance. And right now, in a trial that I only created about a week ago, not surprisingly, there aren't any updates. But if there were updates, there it would say so there. Notice also that from here we can open the environment. Service health, this just tells you what state that particular organization is in. From here though, you've got to access into some of the Power Platform and Power Apps admin centers. And this is the applications. And you can see these are the apps that are currently either installed or available for this instance. Notice that there's actually a lot more than that. And at the bottom, we've got those familiar next page, final page arrows. If we zoom into that, you get, you can read that a little bit more clearly. And more specifically, if we then choose an application that is not yet installed or not configured, we get the opportunity to manage or what that really means is to install it. And the next screen from there will vary depending on what the actual application is. So this is what you get for Dynamics Marketing. And in this particular instance, I don't have the relevant licenses. So when I clicked on the continue, it didn't want to play nicely at all. I did try using the sales insights and that just proves that it is different per application. Click on continue and we get this. Now, by the time I came down here to kick off the session for you, this was still installing. 
but that gives you some idea of what the sales insights application will do over and above sales and once it's finished installing this button will be enabled and we can do the configuration that is the power platform administration center and this is one of this is the way into it from the dynamics 365 admin center that i showed you earlier however if you look at this there's obviously some bugs in this because this is telling me that i've got several thousand percent more database than i'm entitled to because it's dividing by a zero entitlement for whatever reason but that presumably in a fully paid environment that would give you useful information this brings us back in the power platform admin center to the apps so similar to what we looked at earlier but this is probably what we will end up using when the Dynamics 365 Admin Center goes away. This is the Power Automate Admin Center. So this is where we can go in and create new flows within a particular environment. Notice that the URL is admin.flow.microsoft.com and again we can look at environments and inside here we can then go and build a flow so we've done a fair bit of what we've done there later on i'm going to look in a fair amount of detail about managing environments and specifically solutions and i'm focusing quite heavily on solutions because there's a lot of opportunity for them to ask fairly curly questions but within this segment of mb200 you need to be able to know the difference and therefore when you should use a managed or an unmanaged solution you need to know how to determine what components and subcomponents you should put into a solution you need to be able to manage the publishers and know what publishers give you and do for you you need to be able to move the work that you've done from a dev or test globally known as a sandbox environment into one further downstream so typically we've got dev test and prod and your work would move in that order you need to be able to administer environments and we will look at a bit of that and to configure environments but i would strongly recommend in your own environment make sure that you know all of these bits and pieces so I'm going to start by looking at a solution and a solution is a layer of functionality that sits on top of the main application and now of course we've got apps that are sort of sit between solutions and the global Dynamics 365 or common data service big solution each solution is a collection of crm items and an item can be an entity the whole entity or it can be as little as a field or a form or a view a solution can also contain some or all of the necessary security roles web resources and workflows 
overall, a solution is a package of changes. And as we've seen, can be whole entities or new. What is important to be aware of is that a solution is only a pointer to the default solution or the common data service solution until you export the solution. And I've got a diagram to explain that to you. So if you think about that as being representative of either the common data service default solution or what we used to know as the default solution, as a thing that contains all of the customizable entities in the system. Then I've got two very simple additional solutions where solution A contains this thing, this thing, and this thing, whatever they may be. Each of these bits is just an item. So that could be as little as a field where this could be a whole entity and this could be a security role. Solution B contains this and this, but it also contains this item. Because the solutions are only pointers until they are exported, that means that solution A will get all the changes that solution B make to this item and vice versa. So does that make sense to people? Okay, I will assume that it makes sense to everyone since no one else seems to want to talk to me. Okay, solutions are additive. In other words, when you put a second solution into an environment, you get everything that the first solution gave you and everything that the second solution gave you with one exception and that is deletes so you cannot use a solution to pass a delete from dev to test to prod or whatever you need to migrate it deletes always have to be done manually and you do need to understand the differences and the purposes of a managed solution versus an unmanaged solution. And that reference is in the references document, which I will circulate after this evening. So a solution can contain schema items, user interface items, analytics items, process and code items, templates, and security. So to put a bit more detail in that, within schema, it can have whole entities, it can have fields or attributes, relationships that we looked at earlier on in the piece, and global option sets. Within user interface, We've got forms, views, application ribbon, the entity ribbons, sitemap, and web resources. Within analytics, we can have dashboards and charts. In the process code bucket, well, dialogues have been deprecated, workflows, process bars, plugins, and processing steps. Template wise, we've got mail merge templates, email templates, contract and entitlement template, and article or knowledge base templates. 
Note that the Word and Excel templates are not there. Those Word and Excel templates that we talked about earlier are not solution aware. So there is no way that you can transfer those from one environment to another. You have to create them in each environment. And then in the security segment, we can have security roles and field level security profiles. So now it's time for you to do some work. I'm going to leave that up and I'm going to grab the um, memory card for my camera. Okay, so ideas. If you manage an environment of Dynamics 365 and you've hit that problem, what do you need to do? So why do you think it's C? C is actually the right answer. Remember that you, you can't confer deletes. So that's one of the places where that will come and bite you. That depends, and we're going to look at that a little bit later on, it depends exactly where in that overall version hierarchy you are. So hold that question and we will cover it a little bit later on. Okay, so C is the correct answer. What about this one? I'm okay that is the right answer what I want from somebody is why are the others wrong so Yes. Correct. No, you're right. But I want I wanted someone to actually state that. So yes, a full copy would bring a lot more than the stores instance. It would bring the whole kit and caboodle. 
and then obviously the export to Excel and the unmanaged solution, well, there's no way that the data could ever be transferred using a solution. When I say the data, the 185 store locations, that, that sort of data is not solution aware, so that couldn't possibly work. And how you would take the custom entity via Excel, well, your guess is as good as mine. So they are the correct answers. I've got a lot of questions in tonight and I am gonna throw other questions at you because I do want you to understand not only which ones are right and why they're right, but why the others are wrong. So what about this one? <laughs> okay, so we've got one vote for D. What are other people saying? So we've got one vote for A, one vote for D. Can you, the people that are giving the votes, can you justify them, please? Yes, you could. What does the question ask for? I think that is correct. Correct. And that, whoever, I think that was Swether that said that, well done. That is key. The fact that the line that you need to allow removal of customization and solution, that says managed. When you remove an unmanaged solution, all you do is remove the container. Everything that was in it is still there. So that's the right answer. What about that one? So with this question, for those four bullet points, the answer for each of them is either managed or unmanaged. Okay, so if we want to include changes as part of the default solution, is that managed or unmanaged? Correct. Remove changes by uninstalling the solution. Ensure ability to maintain customizations if needed. And prevent others from making changes to the solution. So they are the right answers. 
So unmanaged is what you use when you want to continue work. And that's why the general advice is that when you are developing a solution for, the in, for an actual client, not as an ISV to sell, you use unmanaged solutions. Although that one is getting more and more blurred. Okay. Give that one some thought. Anyone any idea? And by the way, this is why knowing what all of those admin centers will do for you is so important. So of the 10 that are there, can can you rule any of them out? You want five and then get the five in the right order. Can we get... Yes, you could. So that's... Agreed. Okay, so what you say sounds right. So if we got Got it down to five yet? So we got rid of analytics and resources. Um, you should have been able to get rid of some of the next four. I don't think deleting the production instance is going to help us very much, do you? Okay, is anyone going to have a punt at? So, what do you think is the first of those 10 of which we've admitted some are garbage? What's the first step? Correct. Then, what do you do? Okay, I've got one vote for backup. What else? Okay, I know where I would go, but I'm going to ask another question. What does backup do? And what is a backup? Correct. So that one we can give the flick. So what's up, what's step two then? 
correct. So step three, we've got one, we've got two. You've ruled a few out. Yep. Correct. So there's your complete. So they're the steps. Does that make sense to people? And do you understand why it is what it is? Okay, another one for you. What's the second one? Yep. Why? Why? Yeah, you can do it, but is it the right option? Is it the right solution? Okay, I'll put you out of your misery. They're both the publisher of the default solution. Um, well, the implication is if you changed it within the custom solution, you'd only be changing it for the option sets in that solution. And that could get you into quite a mess. That sort of thing you want to be across the whole application. Does, does that make sense? And if you go look, and those two references at the bottom are in the reference list. They're probably in the one I've already given you, but I'm going to give you an updated version of it after tonight. Okay, so we need to look at managing applications using the Dynamics 365 Admin Center and using solutions. So they're things that you need to be aware of. They're not things, well, we've done a fair bit of that and in your own time, with your own environments, make sure that you're across that bit. And what I would recommend is that you tie the points that I'm making on the slides, which have come very much from the Measure Your Skills, to your own environment and to the references on the reference sheet. Now, system administration. You need to be able to do all of that lot and you need to know what each of those are. So what is a connection role? Thank you. 
<laughs> Weak social relationships. Correct. It's actually, well, the key thing is that connection roles are used with connections and they describe that you know, we've got record A, record B, and they are related to each other via this one or maybe these two reciprocal connection roles. Configure language and locales. Who can give me some comments about how that works? Yes, it is. Yep. So, how, let's focus on language. How does it work in Dynamics 365? Imagine you were working for an organization that is multilingual. So for the time being, we'll imagine that we work in the States and while the main language of the organization is English, we have a decent proportion of our employees are Hispanic. So given that scenario, if you were implementing CRM for that organization, and focusing on language, what would you do? So let's imagine you've been called into this hypothetical organization and you've got to set up Dynamics 365 online or on-prem, it really doesn't matter. And then you've got to do the relevant steps so that it works for the English speaking, which is the majority of the company and the Hispanics. Talk me through the relevant steps just to deal with the language. I know we're taking a piece in isolation, but what do you need to do? That's step two. You basically write, but go right the way back. So you've been brought into hypothetical sorry yes so in the scenario that I've given you what is the default language yes so we're going to set up our org as an English Dynamics 365 whether it's online or on-prem so that's step one then following on from what Kim said, we've got those Hispanics that are put in place to make our life difficult, but we've got to keep That's step three. So let's finish what Kim was saying. What language pack do we need to install to keep our Hispanics happy? Which do they speak in Mexico and most of South America? <laughs> yes. So the next step would be to add and install the Spanish language pack. And then step three, after we've added the users, would be to make sure that the Hispanics had their language set to Spanish. And we would only be able to do that once the Spanish language pack has been installed. Does that make sense? Okay, what about currencies? How do currencies work? So let's continue working for our same hypothetical American company, but this company does a lot of trade with Brazil and 
Chile and Argentina. So talk me through what we need to do. Again, just on currencies. Correct. You would, you're right though, yes. I realized after I'd said the question that I haven't got a clue what the currencies in South America are in other languages, but other currencies. Okay. So subjects, what are they? They're not widely used. Yes, they are. They are related to cases. Yes. So there's a few areas where subjects are used and you've got most of them. So we use them with cases. We use them with um, knowledge base articles. And we can, but they've implemented some better functionality now, we can use them with products. And it's one hierarchical tree. So when you're building the subject tree, each one has one parent. And it can be as deep as you need it to be. So it is something, in all honesty, I think you could stay in this space. Well, I've only used them, I think, for three projects in 17 years. I know about them more from training than from actually using them. Okay, going back to our hypothetical company, custom help. So how does that work? It can be additional. So what, what do you mean? What sort of thing might we cover in those additional help topics? Sorry, whoever that is isn't close enough to their microphone. Yeah, so it's more specific. Obviously, the general help is very much just out of the box and it doesn't really, doesn't give anything, any reference to any configuration that you may do. And obviously it doesn't reference your business processes. How could it? The other area where you may want to use custom help is additional languages. And then you link the relevant pages of help via their URL into the entity and so on that it needs to relate to. What about session and inactivity timeouts? Possibly, what are they? Correct. Correct. Yeah. But the key thing is knowing what they do. And Kim was right that if we have an inactivity timeout set to 10 minutes, 
if we go away or go home or whatever, after 10 minutes, we will have to log back in. Okay. What, well, the top three all relate to auditing. So talk to me about auditing. What is it and how do we set it up? So you're right, and that's the fourth option. Yes. So, okay. There are three levels that you need to enable it. So, Let's say we're using a hypothetical project, we're using invoices. And it is very important that we know exactly who does what with invoices. Talk me through everything. So right now we arrive at this company and the reason we've been called in is we've got some employee up to no good and they've been making modifications to invoices that they shouldn't be doing and we or you need to fix this problem so at the moment there is no auditing whoever set their environment up to the point where we're brought in didn't know about auditing and didn't do anything in auditing. So you've got the CFO who's got steam coming out of his ears and you need to talk him through what you're going to do so this good for nothing whoever he or she is can't cause any more problems. So if I'm the CFO talk to me. It's, I'm a CFO and I've brought you in because we've got somebody who's been up to no good with all kinds of invoices, making all kinds of changes and my accounts are in a mess. I've brought you in and I've paid for you. How are you going to fix my problem? The idiots that installed the system didn't know about auditing. Just tell me how. So apart from putting my head in a bucket of cold water to stop the steam, what else are you going to do to me? Yes. Well, I've worked that out. That's the problem. That's why I can't sack the idiot. <laughs> Yes, so now you need to have a conversation with me about just what has said idiot been doing and which fields really matter. And you need to explain a little bit about why we don't want to just audit every field. So I'm going to be a, a CFO now and I'll just say, just audit a whole lot. I just want auditing on for all my invoices. I don't want this mess ever again. And I want you to come back to me and tell me why that's a problem, because it is a problem. It would. Yes. That's the bulk of it. So you really need to have a conversation with me and get me to tell you which fields in the invoice 
really need to keep an eye on. And then it might be sensible to look what other entities do we also need to have a look at. I've brought you in to sort out the invoices, but what other entities do we need to look at? Okay, let's think about the audit logs. What can you tell me as the CFO, who amongst other things pays for the database space? What under the audit logs can you talk to me about? Yeah. Yes. Um, there are some actual set um, settings though. So with the logs, each log is three months. And I'm not aware of that being configurable, but you can delete files. You can't delete the current log file, but you can delete any older log files. You can also back them up so if you're paying for um, online data storage, you pull the last quarter or the previous quarter's log file to a different data store that might be cheaper, including having it on-prem. It may be that you don't need those logs available, so you can just pull them down, put them on a CD and put them in the safe potentially. So anyone, any questions around auditing? Okay, the bottom three. We did touch on those. So who can tell me anything about relevant search, quick find settings and categorized search? Okay, what is quick find? Okay. <laughs> yes. And how do I do that search? Mm. Okay, I'm a not very bright user. Talk me through doing the search that will use that quick find. That's not what the user needs to know. That's what you as the configurator does. Talk to me. How do I get the benefit of those quick find settings? I'm a user. I'm not very bright at that. <laughs> Correct. So if we went to, let's say we go to an accounts view and we type in C-O-N-T and we've got a system with the sample data, what would it then be doing in background? Correct. Correct. Yes. So that's something that needs to be done for each 
entity that users will need to search on. Okay, I'm going to leave the other two for you, but I would strongly recommend that you do those two before you sit the exam. So this is showing where you get to the bulk of those settings. And we haven't looked at all of them. But again, I would strongly suggest that in your own environment, you go into an environment in the Power Platform admin setting and then go into settings. And you will see when you go to settings, you will get that page. You need to know what all of those options are. And just to test your eyesight and to give you an idea of how much there is, I created that slide as well. <laughs> so that is, that is that one, but with all of those options expanded. So that just gives you an idea of how many options. So I'm not going to make you read them to me at the moment, but you do need to know what all of those are and what they mean and things like how you would use them. So how would you talk to a user, a CFO, a CIO, whoever it is that has brought you in as they're relevant in the way that I've been playing around over the auditing. Does that make sense? Okay. So within quality assurance, you need to be able to understand what those different testing or different types of testing are. You also need to be able to do performance tuning, optimization setting. You need to be familiar with the Dynamics 365 diagnostics tool. And for the exam, exam only, you need to know about the data query performance. So, if we focus on testing, what are each of those types of testing? And then how might we develop some scripts to cover those off? Okay, so what is system testing? <laughs> it is, but specifically, particularly with, yeah, it is, it's the end to end system works. What about performance? Yeah. So that is that people don't, for example, click on new and get a spinny wheel and a spinny wheel and a spinny wheel and a spinny wheel. So does the system perform appropriately? What about unit testing? Is it only a developer writing code that needs to do unit testing? 
Correct. So you've been given a business requirement and you've done whatever to deliver that requirement to your client before you show your client you want to go through and then whatever document or conversation notes or whatever were done you would check off that they ask for a i've given them a they ask for b i've given them b they ask for c i've given them c and so on what about regression Yes, and of course, not only code, although it's most likely to be code. But if you bring in a load of data, does that have any deleterious effects on existing stuff? It's anything. So it, what regression is, is when you implement whatever you implement, make sure that you haven't broken anything that was previously working. So now we know what the different types of testing are. If you were given the job of writing some test scripts, what would you do? So imagine you're in the situation that you were brought in to do an implementation. We had some scope and you're now at the point where you need to write some test scripts. How would you go about it? <laughs> yep. Yes. So based on that, and if we assume that in the back room, we've got some testers who don't know the business process, or certainly can't be relied upon to know the business process, what do we need to do in our script? Yes. And what sort of things do we need them to test? Now, this has moved more into UAT now, um, but I'm not too worried about that. Yes. So let's take a very small segment. And let's just imagine, and I know this is out of the box, but let's assume for the purposes of this conversation, for whatever reason, we have developed a form for address. What might go into the test scripts for our testers out the back who don't really know what an address is um, in order to test it? Yep, that's, that's a good example. Yep, so within your test script, you might want to get them to put, um, well, I can, can't pronounce the whole of it, but that place in Wales, Clanfair, Fool, whatever, that's got, um, is it 96 letters in the name? It's the, longest, it's the longest station on the British network, that I do know. So you might decide that you've got somebody that lives there who's about to become a client and does that work. Um, certainly be aware of different data types. So make sure 
that they can't, or with pick lists, make sure that all the correct values are there. So if we had a drop down for postcode, have we got all the values? And in fact, something that I heard about a few months ago, and this was something that because the testing was done by people that don't know our geography, there was a lookup for suburb. It was looking up for the whole of Australia, but because of the lookup limit of 500 in a lookup, if any suburb beyond Taramurra didn't exist. Yeah, <laughs> big oops. But it's a true story. Okay. Another question for you. Yes. Yeah. Why? So what, where are you going? If you were in the exam and you came across this one, you're not going to You've got rid of two of them, so you're down to a one in two chance. You just take a pump. Where's your money going? Okay, so this is the bit where you need to be aware, even though we're up to version nine now, this was a version eight only tool. And what I've also done for you is grabbed a couple of screenshots because you won't be able to see this for yourself in any current environment. I thought I'd give you a couple of screenshots so you can just see where it would have been. So you would have got it through the settings admin area. And then when you go into it, this is what it looks like. So you do need a little bit of familiarity because as I said, it does come in the exam, or at least it did when I did the exam, which was what, two months ago now? No, a bit less. Okay, the diagnostic tool. So you get to the diagnostic tool using that URL, but the bit in purple is your specific CRM URL. So in my trial environment, it would be barely there support.crm6.dynamics.com would take the place of that purple. And then once you've gone to that URL, you see a screen pretty much like this and you click on the run there. So when you first load it, all of this is empty and you've got the run. You click on run 
and then it chunters and does a whole load of magic down here and then it puts the results in there. If any of the tests fail, you will get a, a red failure up there. Okay, so some more questions. <coughs> Correct. And there you go. So the final thing I want to look at is just to run through a little bit about creating, exporting, importing and distributing solutions. In the classic interface, you get to see the solutions by going to settings and solutions and you can do this even on a current environment and if you look at this environment if i can find it there is the common data service solution which is what used to be the default solution so even though we're seeing this in the classic ui this is a fairly new environment i only ran this trial up some point last week to create a solution like anything else you go up to new and when you get to new you then create the solution and once you've created it you can either add new things to it using this new or you can add existing and down here although note there is a scroll bar so you're not seeing all of it but these are all the options that are as we say solution aware if you choose entity you then get this. So I chose the account entity and you see how I can now pick either all the assets, if you go up here, or you can add individual forms, views, charts, fields, keys, relationships, the system messages, business rules, hierarchy settings and dashboards. In other words, any individual component for that you find in the account. And then once you've worked your way through for all of that and any other entities that you're adding, so it says one of one because back here I only chose the account. If I'd got multiple entities, this would say one of two, one of three, one of six or whatever, and it would loop through them. And then eventually you finish. And obviously there's all of these other things that you could put in as well. Now, Note that we have the option to delete a solution and if it is a managed solution, as we've seen, deleting a managed solution will remove all of the components of that solution. Deleting an unmanaged solution just gets rid of the, the solution record itself. Having said that, within when you're designing a managed solution, you get to say exactly how managed it is. So the out of the box managed solutions or what are called the first party managed solutions really cannot be deleted. 
So this is something that you need to be aware of to do with patches and cloning of an entire solution. And before you read all of that, if we come back here, you see there we've got clone a patch and there you've got clone a solution. So you need to know what both of those mean. And the answer is there. So I'll leave you to read that. I'm not going to read that to you. Again, it is taken from one of the references that I will give you later on tonight. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't hear that. It's not a question, it's a definition. So you should have a slide, clones and of solutions. There are some questions to go, but this isn't a question. So this is just, I want you to read and understand that for yourself and make whatever notes you need and then go and check it out in your own environment. Okay, we are getting close to 9.30 and there's a fair bit, well, there's another three or four bits to go through. A question for you is, I showed you the classic interface, something that I want you to work out for yourself. And the reason I've done this is because it is damned tricky in Power Apps to see and manage these solutions. I have spent a big chunk of this afternoon trying to get the steps for that and failing. So there is something that you do need to be able to do in both environments. Okay, what this slide is doing is talking a little bit about the numbering. So when you have a number, a version number of a solution, it's a four number, so, something dot something dot something dot something and normally and the best way of using these numbers is major release minor release build and revision when you clone a solution it will increment the minor release by one so that happens but when you patch a solution, it is either the build or the revision that needs to change. Rarely both. So if it's a revision, it's a very small patch. Build is a bit bigger. So does that make sense to you? Okay, there's the test then. Sorry, I heard the rule out, but didn't hear what you were ruling out. Why?
Maybe. <laughs> What else do people think? So when we clone it, it's the releases that go up. Now, according to the answers, it is B. But I think that's wrong. Oh no, no, it could be B. Yeah. Mm. But if we're on 2.4.2.6, why would we get all the way when all we do is a clone? Why would we get the three? Point three point six at the end. What it's getting at is that your clone takes the four to five. This is the first time you've done a clone in 2.4, so it becomes 2.5.0.1. Point point <laughs> Happy with that? And that's that same question, but with a lot of further information, which you're welcome to have a look at. I'll leave it just for a minute. And if you look at the bottom paragraph, it does explain quite a lot. And that information does come again from one of the references in the references list. So we'll move on. And there's another question for you. Oh, that, you've seen that one tonight, right? We'll move on. Okay. So this and one more question and then we'll call it a night. Sorry? Oh yeah, so we did. Okay. Oh, in that case, you can get an early mark. It's only 9.30. Because the final slide is just the answer. So I've obviously been copying them and not deleting them. My apologies. Okay, so next week I will do a Q&A session and then you can all go and sit the exam. Or I should say you can all go and pass the exam. Okay, I will send, well, for everybody who was registered tonight, I will later on this evening, I'll send the up-to-date reference list to you. It's pretty humongous at the moment. So if you work through those references and using a trial environment, plus all the other bits that I've suggested as we've gone through, you should have a pretty good understanding of what is needed and next week we'll do a q and a okay i'll see you well i might see you um let's just see if we stop put the share